Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Steve Porter. I'm the executive director of the Martin Institute here at Westmont, and it's uh, my privilege to introduce our presenter speaker for today, uh, who is Dr. Stan Rosenberg. Um, Stan is uh, founded and directs uh, SCIO, do you call it? Yeah, Science and Christianity in Scholarship, Scholarship and Christianity in Oxford. Thank you. Uh, which is the study abroad program that some of you might uh, be interested in considering uh, while you're here at Westmont. Uh, but Stan is also a member of the Faculty of Religion and Theology at the University of Oxford and a teaching uh, fellow or member of Wycliffe Hall, which is one of the many uh, colleges of the University of Oxford. Uh, I met Stan a long time ago, uh, about 20 some odd years ago, uh, when I lived in Oxford, my wife and I did, and my wife actually worked for Stan um, as his assistant for a time, so it's good to see uh, Stan again. He suggested that I could tell um, uh, unsavory stories about him, but I don't think I have any unsavory ones, but, but probably some, some humorous ones. But uh, Stan will be presenting today on uh, spiritual life in the seculum, uh, the alternative uh, Augustine. So uh, join me in welcoming St Dr. Stan Rosenberg. Thank you. It's a real delight to be here. Let me just get mic'd up here for you. Or not for you, but for others, I guess. Um, it's really a pleasure, and I always have a great time coming back to Westmont, partly because I have a long family history here. My mother was a student here and was part of the group that moved from LA up here to uh, Montecito during World War II, and my father spent his first year of university here before heading off to Berkeley. Uh, just after World War II. So I have a real sense of a long history of connection to this institution and really delighted to be here uh, for this day. I've had multiple visits and always enjoy it. And thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Porter and to earlier to the Augustine scholars and Dr. Covington for the kind of hospitality and rich hospitality I've had. And of course, many friends here over the years of projects we've worked on where we do do science uh, as a part of SCIO with our engagement with science and religion but we are broader dealing with scholarship and not just the sciences. So it's a delight to be with you. And um, I've been asked to engage with, uh, with Augustinian spirituality as a part of the work of the Martin Center and the Dallas Willard Center. My thanks to them for asking me to do this uh, and engaging with Augustine. And when, we, uh, when I say Augustine, we all have different images. Now, first let me ask, show of hands, how many have read something of Augustine? Okay. Uh, the Confessions, City of God, all of it. <laughs> okay, good, impressive. Um, a few of you, I think, would have read his com some of his commentaries on Genesis. Yeah, good. Yeah, I knew that there would be a show of hands over from uh, the left, the right wing over here. My right, your left. Um, and uh, the, many other works, of course. When we think, say Augustine, now he's somebody who had a uh, very long career, 40 years, wrote extensively, and that meant, as a result, we all have different images of Augustine. Because when you read somebody who's written extensively, we'll all have read different things, we'll have heard and responded to, or treated, or reacted to in different contexts. So I wonder how you think of Augustine. Perhaps you think of him as Augustine the writer. Here he is on uh, your left side, holding, you can see what he's holding, book. There's Augustine writer. Maybe you think of him as uh, Augustine. This is the medieval iconography of Augustine often shows Augustine with a heart of flame. The icon identified with Augustine is a heart of flame. So there's Augustine in the middle with a heart. Uh, interesting to see that kind of shape for a heart early on at that period in the 15th, uh, 16th century, rather, uh, as we think about how images are represented. Perhaps some of you, uh, the passionate, contemplative, mystic Augustine. This is the image you think of. Uh, for some, it might be this. Cello's painting of Augustine, which perhaps presents a little bit of the hammer of God raining down power on Pelagius for his fallacious views of free will. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is your image of Augustine. This is my favorite image of Augustine. It's not, I think, the best image of Augustine. It's my personal favorite that I had printed and sitting above my desk uh, during my, that long, dark night of the soul we call dissertating. <laughs> I, when I was working on Augustine's commentaries on Genesis and looking at working on his use of Greco-Roman science in the way he interpreted Genesis, and for somebody interested in the history of science, it's part of my work is history of science, uh, lots of red meat in here. <laughs> so look over here, like what do you see in the cabinet? Anyone recognize the instruments? 
Look carefully, Russ, this is really in your field. Related, but well, it's not quite mathematics. And astrolabes, astrolabes in there. Or you can't really see it very well, but that's a nocturnal for looking at the night sky. There's sand clock, all instruments of Renaissance science. This is just a good Renaissance library. Um, and most importantly, anyone recognize this instrument? That's an armillary sphere from Ptolemy. By the way, anyone ever hear that the medievals thought the world was flat? Yeah, that's a myth. All you have to do is look at any kind of, we'll go to any medieval cathedral practically, and you see the ass when you see the cosmic Christ sitting on a globe. <laughs> kind of hard to say that it's flat. And then you have the armillary sphere, and, and ancients and medievals would never think of something being flat because it's not a perfect, uh, it, it's an imperfect structure. Uh, so it would always be a circle, be, it would be a globe. Um, so that's m my favorite image. Actually, that was probably the, uh, the cardinal of Venice, his face. That's what painters did then in order to win, win uh, for the rights to paint something. To get, they would get funding, like, okay, let me put this painting up there and if you'll pay for it, I'll put your face into it, is basically the way it would work. Um, and so that really inspired me. I could imagine that was Augustine working on Genesis. It wasn't, but I could imagine that as I was doing that thing. This is probably the best, not, it's not accurate, but the best representation we have of Augustine. That's from the uh, Lateran Palace. It was Gregory the Great's palace from about 100, 150 years after Augustine in Rome. This is, if anyone's been to Rome, this is in an archeological dig down under the Scala Sancta, uh, the Church of the Holy Steps. I had to get permission from the Archbishop who oversees the Vatican Library to go down into there and see that. Um, it was really, a, for me, a special thing to be able to go down and see that image. That gives you a sense of the bishop in his see, his, that is the bishop's chair at the time. But this is probably the most important image of Augustine in terms of positioning our understanding of him. That's a Bernini statue. It's at the high altar in St. Peter's. You have the, the doctors of the church, the four doctors. And can you tell what Augustine is doing there? What's important is his stance. What's Augustine doing? Say it aloud. Preaching. Preaching. That's, decla this, he's dec that's declamation. That's the, the style of preaching or, or, or declamation. And it's Augustine the preacher that is most important to understand Augustine. We tend to think of Augustine the writer, but he was first and foremost a preacher. He gave somewhere between 4,000 and 10,000 sermons in his lifetime. We have about uh, 950 extant, that is 950 still available to look at. For someone like me as an ancient historian, that's a huge data set. <laughs> it's just great to work with. But he was first and foremost a preacher. And even his books that you read were not written the way you write. That is, he dictated every single one of his books and would do it with one set of edits. You think about how often uh, you edit just a paper you turn in for one of your faculty. Every time you hit backspace on your computer, that's an edit. You, delete a, you write a word and you think, no, that's not the right word. You delete it, that's an edit. Augustine. Would, would dictate a, a section of a book. His secretary would, re, would put it down onto the wax booklet, the, the wax tablet, read it back to him. Augustine would dictate a set of edits, done. And he's doing multiple books at the same time. And you think, how did this guy write 93 books, 94 books in 40 years? Or a lot of simultaneous writing. And some books that took many years, like The City of God was a 13-year project. His mm -hmm. literal commentary on Genesis that I work on was about a 17-year project. Mm -hmm. So some of these took a great amount of time and investment. So Augustine is somebody who has really shaped the West and our tradition, but has often been profoundly misunderstood. And part of it is on the way he understood the nature of salvation and spirituality, and that's what I want to touch on today. For those of you who haven't um, worked with Augustine much and saw many hands that you've read Augustine, well, let me just give some context, because I'm a historian, context matters. <laughs> um, so, and this sets up the way he would think about things. So for the, the third century of Roman society was a period of constant chaos, civil war. The whole century was a period of civil war. This particular period, I listed, had itself 70 emperors in a 35 year period. Only one of them died of natural causes. Uh, all of them killed by their successor. 
or their successor's troops, except for the one who died of natural causes. Some lasted as short as two weeks, a month. One lasted six years. That was a bit of a shock. Um, the Romans were brilliant at engineering. You know them for perhaps their engineering marvels across Europe. Also brilliant at engineering death. Think of crucifixion. And at war. And constantly at civil war. And that really sets up how we have to engage and understand Augustine. Partially, we need to remember that war changes a culture. I, one of the things that really, I don't know about you, but really bothers me when we're talking about issues of war in our society, we'll talk about the consequences in terms of material consequences. This much death, blood, this much amount of money to be spent. Rarely do we hear people talk about the cultural consequences of war. War changes the way a culture thinks. For me, watching the US from afar for the last 25 years of living in Oxford, the kinds of preoccupations we have now, I think, would be very different had we not been on a war footing during the knots when we were carrying out the war on terror. We, we think differently. The way we, I would venture to say, the way we're handling migrants and refugees now is very much shaped by the experience of that period, where it changes the way we think about the identity of people around us and ourselves. And that happened during this period. So Augustine comes into a culture that has gone through not just one massive change, but a second one. Because in, at the end of yet another civil war, this young upstart out of York, Constantine, marches on Rome in 313 and wins a battle he shouldn't have won. It, it, I, I, sorry, I'm not a military historian, but I do end up dealing with some military history as, a, as an ancient and Roman historian. Uh, Constantine marched on Rome with outnumbered three to one and was going up against fortification together with the river Tiber. So he had a river crossing and a fortification immediately behind the river crossing and he was outnumbered three to one. Odds were not with him. Except in their minds, he had a special benefit. Anyone know what that was? Shortly beforehand, he, sometime in the months leading up to it, perhaps while crossing the uh, uh, crossing the mountains, had a vision of Christ and put the ancient Christian symbol of the hero, that was an, that's an X with a, uh, with a Greek R, it looks like a P, um, uh, put, uh, painted on the shields of his soldiers and goes in and wins a battle he should have lost. And as a result of that, you, you have a new kind of status for Christianity, so he makes Christianity a legal religion, the favored religion, he makes it legal, and the favored religion, by the end of the century, under Theodosius, it was made the official sole religion of the empire, but it changed drastically the status and structure of the church within society and the self-identity, both of Christians and Romans. And we live with the consequences of that to this day. And so it reshapes the way they think about it. And he does, he, he does an unthinkable thing, which actually fits in with good pagan political philosophy. So if you notice this date, 323, 324, he calls the Council of Nicaea. That was a shocking thing for an emperor to do, unless one understands Roman political philosophy. So the Romans had, their political theology, political philosophy was driven by one key idea. Well, they had multiple ideas, I shouldn't oversimplify. But a key idea was the notion of the Pax Deorum. Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods. And so in Roman, remember I said they were great engineers? They thought you could also re reverse engineer our understanding. So in Roman thought, if there is civic uh, disharmony, if there are problems, it's because somebody is not worshiping the gods are right. There will be harmony in society if all parts of society are following the proper rights, R-I-T-E. And, and they thought you could reverse engineer it. So somebody's not worshiping God correctly, therefore we have disharmony. So what do you think is going on during a period of the third century? <laughs> Constant civil war. Somebody is not worshiping the god or right. And so they would look, who's different? Who's the different body? Who are the diff who's the different group? The Christians. Now, if you read church historians from that period, they would say that this was a program against Christianity because they hated Christ. I don't think that quite, you know, with the perspective of time, we can see that there's something more going on. Because in the face of chaos and civil war, they, the thing that they would value would be loyalty. And so they would impose loyalty oaths. In the ancient world, politics and religion were two sides of the same coin. 
and perhaps not just the ancient world. <laughs> and so the emperor would impose a loyalty oath, worshiping at the uh, genius of the emperor, which was also a, a religious test of sorts. It wasn't really a religious test, it was a religious act. It was a political test, it was a religious act, and Christians wouldn't do it. So Constantine ends up doing similar sorts of things, except now they're Christianized sorts of oaths and tests that come to bear. And so this is the world in which Augustine is born. He's born in 354, so he's born at a critical time in the midst of all these changes. Here's just some of the key dates for Augustine with some of his major works. Now, and this, sets up, this is all to set up and understand what's going on with Augustine's critique of the spirituality he inherited and how he's going to press forward. In the <clears throat> after Constantine, there is a sense of great triumphalism. You can imagine this. You're a Christian. You've been persecuted. You've just come. You know, in 310 to 312, there were some of the worst persecutions that the Christians experienced. And then you have this young upstart march on Rome and win using the name of Christ. Well, what ensues? Triumphalism. Not surprising, right, that that would be the response. And so there's a sense of the sudden collapse of the, or, of the pagan order, that this is new, a new order. The, these are Christian times. And you would have, you would have a restructuring of a, a phrase that some of us in theology would describe as salvation history. So a way of rethinking the nature of God's work in history. So uh, if, I don't have a whiteboard here, so I usually try and mark this out, but um, the... Um, this is under Eusebius, they would begin to position and think, okay, after the fall, there's a collapse, and there are steps forward in God's providential order of time. So come Abraham, Moses, David, these are all steps forward in God's plan of salvation. Then you have Jesus, but it doesn't stop with Jesus, right? Because we still have sin and death, there's still suffering, so we're not back to, the, to a pre-fallen state. For Eusebius, what he does, which is shocking, like I, you couldn't imagine someone from the second or third century thinking this way, he posits that Constantine, a political ruler, a, a Roman ruler, is the next substantial step forward in God's plan for the ages. Constantine is God's man and is part of God's divine ordering. Now that's shocking. He's identified the Roman order with God's eternal plan. And they would say things like, his, those after Eusebius would say things like, God's, uh, the roads of Rome, these great Roman roads, are now the place, the, the tool used for the spread of the gospel. Rome is God's people. There is a kind of exceptionalism here. Might be surprising, we have that in our own century our own day. Ideas of exceptionalism. It was an exceptional place. And they were an exceptional people. And you have this adoption of the Pax Deorum as a part of it. And look at these. Um, anyone ever read Prudentius, the poet Prudentius? I bet many of you have sung Prudentius's poems. Because if you look at the, the back of a traditional hymnal, a number of the hymns we sing, in, if, you have a, if you go to a church that has a traditional hymnal, <laughs> There wasn't if there wasn't there. Um, if you look at a traditional hymnal, there are many hymns that still are sung today in churches that are Prudentius's uh, poems, hymns put to music. But look at these quotes. I mean, this would be, this would be unthinkable 100 years before this to have had this. Rome fled from her old ear, uh, her old ears, her old ears, and shook the dark mist from her wrinkled face, her nobility now ready to enter on the ways of eternity to follow Christ at the calling of her great leader. That is Constantine that he's referring to there. We're looking at this. Now all mankind united under the rule of Remus. Who's Remus? Romulus' brother. Romulus' brother, the founders of Rome, the, myth the mythical founders of Rome. Customs once diverse, now agree in speech and thought. This was destined in order that the authority, interestingly, word, the word there for authority is use, law, in order that the law of the Christian name might bind with one tie all that is anywhere on earth. I mean, this is, a, this is a profound shift of self-identity, of culture, of church, of spirituality. Unthinkable. You, you couldn't imagine uh, Origen, or you know, the second and third century authors, Origen, Justin Martyr, Athenagoras, let alone Paul, writing something like this. 
So we have to understand that the church has changed. We have to remember that the church can change and change its identity, and we have to then be able to, uh, to reflect on that and, to, and judge that. It's into this that Augustine then comes and, re- and challenges this. So he inherits this tradition and rethinks it. And there are three, um, three key theological concepts that Augustine brings to bear in his reflection that I want to give to you now. There's more than this, but these are three critical building blocks. And in fact, in many ways, these are the key building blocks to understand any of Augustine's theology. Um, if, you're do, if you're reflecting on Augustine and you can't see one of these present, you might not have read it well enough or gone far enough with it. So it's almost, you know how accountants use a test for checking their numbers? This is almost like a theologian's test. Can you see these things in Augustine? If you can't, maybe you need to go back and rethink your understanding of Augustine. That's true. I would say it's true of almost any of his significant works from the three, mid-390s on, basically from the Confessions forward. So the first is his understanding of evil. Augustine inherited a tradition of evil that led to his leaving the church, frankly. So if you know the story of Augustine, as a teenager, he fled from the church of his mother in North Africa, and it was because of kind of a biblical literalism that they had and the way they thought about the problem of evil. Augustine had an instinctive an intuitive vision that God must be good. And any way of presenting God, of engaging with the divine that didn't, get, didn't convey the goodness of God for him was immediately problematic. And because of that, he fled to a Gnostic heresy that, called Manichaeism that he thought provided the answer for him. Later on, he concluded it didn't. But he lent to it for that reason. And amidst this, he rethinks the problem of evil. Because here's the problem, for, and it's true for any theistic tradition. Probably a lot of people out there, I don't know in this room, but out broadly, church, would be willing and, and inclined to say that evil is some sort of thing. Seem plausible statement? There's a problem, though. If evil is some sort of thing, you, anyone in a the theistic tradition, so it's not just true of Christianity, has a specific problem with that, or should have a problem with that. Why? Well, who's the creator of all things? God. And that's the problem he had, is this presented God as being the, 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 the problem, being the cause of evil. And it sets up the kind of critiques you get from someone like Hume, for example, but I won't go into that now. So he, he takes a, a Greek Neoplatonic idea from Plotinus called privation, he alters it, he reshapes it, gives it a different form. It is distinctly a different form than what he takes from his source called privation, or privatio boni, a privation of the good. And so he says, simply, and just solves the problem. Evil is nothing. Everyone happy with that solution? <laughs> so I can move on? <laughs> How many of you have heard of privation before? A third of the room, maybe? Um, so privation redefines evil not as a thing, but as a qualitative disruption of things. It's like corruption or corrosion. I, I love cycling. I, I do a lot of cycling around Oxford and in England. Uh, I also am a mechanic. I really enjoy things that work well. And I've also had a very good bicycle stolen in Oxford, actually several <laughs> over time. One of them outside of Christchurch when I was offering a uh, seminar to my graduate students on Augustine. How <laughs> ironic is that? Um, but um, the, uh, so now I keep an old, horrible bicycle at the office that I used to ride into town. It's got a very rusty chain. I dislike it intensely. Like I will even swear at it while I'm riding it because it's so bad. But I have the particular benefit of expecting that no one would steal it. And if they did, well, I'm out 10 pounds and I can go find another really poor bike. For Augustine, privation is a bit like that bicycle. Except we're not talking about material things, we're talking about ensouled beings, sold things. Privation deals with moral and spiritual things. Privation is a disruption, a corruption, a corrosion of a good thing. It is God makes something out of nothing Evil is a movement back towards nothingness. Now, it's really critical to understand on this, though, that there's absolute good, but there can be no absolute evil. And that would critique some Christian positions. Why couldn't there be absolute evil? Think about this a moment. 
Why is absolute evil a non-starter, if you think in terms of privation? What is absolute evil? Nothing. And you can't talk about nothing. You might think some people talk about nothing. <laughs> but actually, it's a non-turn. It's a non-thing. And so he's not doing something Eastern. He's not pulling like something that you would think of an Eastern religion. He's redefining evil as a, as a corrosive thing. And so we have to understand when we are dealing with people who are, when we're dealing with our own, let alone others, brokenness or sinfulness or disrupt, disruptiveness, we're talking about something that's a disruption of our essential being. For Augustine, God makes something out of nothing and being, therefore, has value. Every, if it exists, it has a degree of goodness because it comes from God. Now, he makes an important distinction, which I'll say for this, our STEM folks in the room, that he, he distinguishes between decay and privation. So privation is what is something he uses to describe moral, spiritual reality. But he thinks simultaneously that anything, and he says, anything that can be made can be unmade. That is, decay is an essential and natural part of this world. So we don't have to figure out, wrestle with and say, okay, now how is it that the fall happens and now all of a sudden we've got grass turning brown or hurricanes happening. It, it sorts out the problem of animal predation. It sorts out all sorts of problems as we think about physiological phenomena. We don't have to, in, for Augustine's thinking, attach any kind of physiological decay to a fall. Those are two separate things. So he's dealing with privation here as a moral, spiritual disruption of our person. Does that make sense? Should I describe privation? It's really, it is the critical building block in Augustine. I haven't, re I've read, I haven't read all of Augustine. You should be distrustful of almost anyone who tells you that. Um, I've read a lot of Augustine, though I will say, and I haven't read a full work of his where privation theory, at least from his, uh, from his relatively early middle works on, doesn't feature as a significant part of his theological framing. It shapes every bit of it. It certainly can't understand the city of God and his political theology without this. Or his understanding of hermeneutics and semiotics and his work on Christian instruction turns on this. His view of the person, his theological anthropology turns on this. So this also then changes, I'll jump down to the Imago Dei, his, the image of God. It, shape, it shapes the way he thinks about the Imago Dei. How would that impact the Imago Dei? Any thoughts? Is understanding the Imago Dei. What is the image? What happens to an image in light of privation? It gets ruined. Gets ruined, but not absolutely ruined. So there are two broad, broadly speaking, there are two big theological traditions on theological anthropology about interpreting the impact of the fall. One group would say that the image was completely lost at the fall, and we're no longer image bearers until Christ redeems us. Augustine thought that in his early career, at the beginning. Upon adopting and wrestling through the privation, he rethinks that. And what do you think it meant his position would be afterwards? The image is marred. It, it is broken. Ruined, as long as one doesn't think of it ruined in, uh, implying absolutely destroyed. Marred is probably a better word. And that would uh, affect what is possible. Interestingly, for, for those of you interested in the doctrine of predestination, for Augustine, this is really critical to understand why he argued for predestination. Now, you will hear some people say that this was all about the sovereignty of God. And while he does use the language of sovereignty from time to time, actually it's all about his anthropology that a ruined image can't save itself, and, and we lose freedom. He's very teleological. Do you know this term, teleology? Meaning a focus on the ends and aims and purpose. And so for Augustine, an imago dei that's marred has lost its freedom. Freedom is defined teleologically, but hasn't lost its free will. So I can still make choices in life. This will be important for our psychologists in the room. I can still make choices in life. I still have free will. This is not absolute determinism. But I've lost the ability to fulfill the function that God has designed for me. I've not, I am no longer free in a teleological sense. I have free will in terms of ability to make particular choices. 
But because I'm marred, I wouldn't choose the divine way. And so for him, predestination becomes important as otherwise there would be no one who is saved. And it's not, there's no sense of a double predestination as would evolve under Calvin, who thought he was saying the same thing as Augustine, but wasn't. So this changes his frame. And then the third, which I've already referred to in different ways, is creation out of nothing. Creatio ex nihilo. Augustine is the first theologian in the West to form this into a real doctrine. Creation out of nothing existed as an idea from the first, second, first century BC, started within a Jewish Platonic circles of, Pla of Philo. Um, gets picked up and used in the second century, but it was always used as an apologetic tool, as an apologetic hammer against the dualist. It wasn't actually used for, the, you know, those who have studied theology will understand the phrase constructive theology. It wasn't used to actually construct theology, it was just used as a weapon, if you will, a tool to critique others. It wasn't until Augustine in the West and the Cappadocians, the Greek theologians in the East, that it, it evolves into an actual theological tool by which you use to build other parts of his theology. So he uses it to help reshape the way he understands the Imago Dei and his whole theological framing. So with this, Augustine relocates the problem. They had thought of the problem being very external. Evil is a thing. You know, with thinking about this, Augustine reframes it, that we are deeply alienated. Alienation is, is, is the deep trouble that that shapes each of us. Peter Brown, a great biographer of Augustine, has, I think, a very, either things you would disagree with, or should disagree with, I think, with Peter Brown's work, but he is certainly one of the great scholars of Augustine. He makes this statement, which I think is, really captures it. The, the, worst, and the Christian's worst enemy is can no longer be placed outside him. They are inside his sins, his doubts, the climax of, of a person's life would not be martyrdom, but conversion from the perils of his own past. Augustine is credited with what you would describe as the inward turn, the, the, that se deep sense of self-reflection inwardly, that, that, self, uh, that analysis that, that understands the problem inside. It, it, they would think of sin, the problem previously to this, they would think it was being very external. Uh, some of you may remember um, oh, Peretti's novels. You guys know, some of you know who I'm talking about. What's the, what, the title of the book? Um, yeah, piercing darkness. So he actually gets, not Augustine, but the spirituality before Augustine. <laughs> so in Peretti's vision, if I was slothful, that's a sin, that's one of the seven deadly sins, if I was slothful, or if I was lustful, or whichever sin, um, uh, it's because of that the demon of sloth was attacking me. Remember this in Peretti's novels, if you've read them? It's something very external that grabs onto you. The enemy was external. It might have been the Roman Empire that was persecuting me, or it might have been that devil that was attacking me. What Augustine does is with privation theory, with his thinking, rethinking about theological anthropology, he understands the structure that there's something deeply flawed, corrupted, privated it within me, and this is the problem from which I suffer. And so that he reshapes, so we're divided, alienated from God, you can use different words here, alienation, dislocation, disruption. The alienated from God, I get alienated, if I can't know God, I'm, alienated, I'm separate from God, I'm gonna get alienated from within. If I can't get along with God and myself, well then I can't get along with you. And so there's social alienation, social dislocation. And I'm also alienated from the cosmos. Very critically here, there have been some who have misrepresented Augustine as saying that the cosmos is alienated from God. And Augustine clearly does not say that. It's I'm alienated from the cosmos as a result of, of, of what has happened. So, where do we go with that? Here, uh, just a couple of quotes from the Confessions that give you a sense of this. Look at this bottom one. I beg you, O Lord my God, to look on me and listen to me. Have pity on me. Heal me. For you see that I've become a problem to myself. It's actually, the pro word pro problem there is actually question. I've become a question to myself. It's really fascinating the way he, his language is enriching. And this is the ailment from which I suffer. So there's this deep sense. My powers in inner self are veiled in darkness, which I must deplore. When mind speculates on its own capabilities, it realizes it cannot safely trust its own judgment. 
And this is how, what one needs in order to understand what he's doing in the confessions. <clears throat> because it's an extended prayer of self, if you will, of self-discovery. It's, it's autobiographical, it's not an autobiography, it's a literary work, and it's an interesting literary work, but, and it reveals something of himself, but it's not an exact autobiography by the standards of what autobiography is, but he's praying through his life in order to get, to solve these problems, to have revealed what he can't understand about himself. Now think about this aspect. Augustine loves him. This is why this is autobiog autobiographical, not autobiography. There are three scenes with woods that show up, or trees that show up in the, uh, within, the, uh, 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 within the work. So in book two, he's got the pear tree. Many of you have read the Confessions, right? You remember the pear tree incident? He steals pears with his friends, and he can't get it. It, it, he doesn't understand why he stole the pears. He has been shaped, there, this, this is actually a critique of Aristotelian ethics, and I won't go into the detail, but he essentially is coming to grips with something's in right, why did I steal the pears from that pear tree? And then in book eight is, the, is his conversion underneath the fig tree with his friend Olypius. And, uh, and so we have a garden scene. And then there's a third grove uh, or garden scene in book nine with his mother in Ostia where they have this vision. Now what do those three scenes remind you of? Those are direct figurative uh, treatments. What does it remind you of? What's the first scene? Pear tree. The fall, this is the garden. The conversion, Gethsemane. The vision of Ostia, tree of life, 20, Revelation 21. So he is reflecting something about this, about this movement of life there. And now, let me get to the core. This was all the setup to understand how he understands the nature of salvation and conversion. Then we'll have time for uh, questions and discussion. You'll have heard it, you might have heard it said, if you picked up many potted histories of theology, you would, you would read that the West, when it comes to the doctrine of atonement, would, would teach us that the West uh, understands atonement as, as ransom or ca from captivity. And the East had this funny, different theological framing of deification or theosis. And Augustine is the great representative of the Western tradition. The Western tradition really takes its framing from Augustine. And you'll see that in any pod history, and some very important, at their time, technical theological works earlier in the last century. And that would be the standard telling. You can still hear people say that and teach that. Until one starts reading Augustine, and particularly one needs to go to his sermons, the problem is people are reading the wrong things. They're reading his anti-Pelagian works, which have a very narrow particular purpose, and taking their understanding from that. And so he uses a phrase like this in his uh, sermon on, uh, Sermon 38 on John's Gospel. Christ is the former and reformer of humans, the creator and recreator, the maker and remaker. Remember those three building blocks I mentioned? Creation out of nothing, imago dei, and privation. And you can find that in the way he phrases this. Or in this. And so when we see him just as he is, then our travels abroad will be over. Christ's deformity is what gives form to you. If you had been unwilling to be, sorry, if he had been unwilling to be deformed, you would never have got back the form you lost. So he hung on the cross deformed, but his deformity was our beauty. Or this. That mediator in whom we can participate and by participation reach our happiness is the uncreated word of God by whom all things were created. And yet he's not the mediator in that he is the word, for the word, being preeminently immortal and blessed, is far removed from the wretched mortals. He is a mediator in that he is man by his very manhood, making it plain that for the attainment of that good, which is not only blessed but beatific, we have not to look for mediators through whom we may think we can achieve the approach to happiness. God himself, the blessed God, who is the giver of blessedness, became partaker of our human nature and thus offered us a shortcut to participation in his own nature. 
Now that's it, that bottom, for, I, I probably didn't need to read the whole upper part, but I just wanted to give you some of the, the feel of Augustine's language. But look at that last, set of, uh, last sentence. He became the partaker of our human nature. This is the language of theosis or deification. God became man that man could be like unto God. Now it's not, it's talking about um, morally, if you will, not ontologically. Normally people would say, well, that would be what you expect to find in Irenaeus and Gregory of Nazianzus and Gregory the Great, the, the Greek authors. And this is, uh, forms this, this doctrine, if you will, of theosis. And yet here we have it, I think not as complex and as well developed as you find in some of these Greek authors, but you nonetheless have a deep sense of theosis and it makes sense of his theology. So when you read the Confessions, you're reading Augustine laying out this notion that we see here at the bottom. He treats salvation as a kind of convalescence. It's almost, and we all, we all have stories and family that, for whom this could be a painful example, but it's almost like how we think about cancer. You first go in for cancer treatment and you have to have it cut out. That's the redemptive moment. But then there's, it's not ended at that point. There needs to be convalescence. There's ongoing medical work that's needed beyond the surgery itself. And so for Augustine, Augustine spirituality is defined as a, a, the renewal of the Imago Dei in light of his understanding of privation. That the, it was corrupted, it's corroded, and we have to continue on with it. It's really important to understand that for Augustine, we don't experience perfection now, and that's part of what he fought. When I, when I was doing my doctoral work, I had one of the great Augustine scholars as my mentor, Robert Marcus, and Robert once said to me, um, something that I, I have to say I rejected it for about five years. I had to work with Augustine a lot longer before I could get to the point of accepting what I think was the wisdom of his statement. But it just sounded wrong. <laughs> he, he said that Augustine was the apologist for the mediocre Christian life. Really? <laughs> Can that be right? And I walked away from that. But when you look at Augustine's theology, and you look at his, particularly at his theological debates, the truth of that plays itself out. So he left Christianity as a late teenager over the kind of biblical perfectionism, the literalism that he found in the community that he left. Then you look at what he went into. He went into the Gnostics. He was attracted and then repelled by their rationalistic perfectionism. And then you look at his next major debate with the Donatists. He rejected institutional and sacramental perfectionism. That there is no perfect true church, as they were asserting and therefore all the rest of you are imperfect and should be rejected. Then his next big debate was with Pelagius, and there he's rejecting individual ethical perfectionism. And then you look at his city of God, and he's rejecting the political perfectionism by which they had identified Rome as the perfect embodiment of God's plan for the ages. Augustine, has a sense that we live in a disrupted, decayed, both physiologically decayed and then morally, in terms of privation, afflicted world. And that defines the world as we know it today. And so there's a little bit of a sense in which to live the Christian life now is to manage the alienation and manage the disruptions that are a part of our life spirituality as a kind of management of the disruptions. We can't expect to get away from the dislocation. We could hope for doing better, or maybe in certain seasons of our life, life worse. It's not a straight line or straight path for him. But we have to understand that Christ comes then to help us, and so we live the life of a convalescent. To be sure this renewal does not happen in one moment of conversion, in the, sorry, let me just give a little explanation for that first sentence. Um, conversion in the ancient world for Augustine, and really it was part of the church's tradition up until, and even in some of the, uh, the Protestant and evangelical circles until real, I think the language changed in the late 19th century. But conversion was something that was referred to the whole return to God. So we tend to use conversion in Protestant circles today to refer to that first initial moment. Come to, the, come to the altar call, be converted. For him, for most of the history of the church, conversion was this, was the whole life of return. 
of, uh, of, of renewal, of restructuring. So it doesn't happen in one moment, as the baptismal renewal by forgiveness of all sins happens in a moment, so there is an initial moment of change, but that not even one tiny sin remains unforgiven, but it's one thing to throw off a fever and another to recover from the weakness. Remember what I, just, I was describing, the sense of convalescence? It is one thing to remove from the body a missile struck in it, another to heal the wound, to make, complete the cure. The first stage of the cure is to remove the cause. This is done by pardoning all sins. The second stage is to curing the disability or the debility itself, and done gradually by making steady progress in the renewal of this image. These two stages are pointed out in the psalm where we read, He is gracious to all you, to, sorry, gracious to all your iniquities, which happens in baptism, and heals all your infirmities, which happens by daily advances while the image is being renewed. Interestingly, you will hear many sermons uh, from Galatians, Paul talking about bearing one another's burdens. Augustine interprets that when we are bearing one another's burdens, we are bearing one another's sinful life. We are to live is to live in community with one another and bear up and bear along with each other amidst our brokenness. So I think I often thought of bearing one another's burdens as I'm helping someone out with their weakness or you know, I'm, I'm gonna listen to their pain and they, they can come tell me their sorrows and I'll pray for them. For Augustine, bearing one another's burdens meant we, are, we recognize that we are broken figures who are convalescing and we're alongside other broken figures who are convalescing and we will give them the space and the grace to convalesce alongside us. And so it changes his understanding of the nature of community. And that also explains his understanding of ascent. I'm gonna move on from that. Let me just um, say a couple things about pastoral spirituality and then um, I'll bring it to a close. Augustine rejects what he found to be a terrifying message. The perfection, this is, um, I didn't put it in full quotes because I, I want to emphasize his, his reflection, but this is not his statement. This is my, um, my summary of his comment, comments. Perfection is, uh, it, 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 there should be an if there. If perfection is possible, it is oblig therefore obligatory now. That's what he rejected in Pelagius' position, is it created a sense of obligation now. Imperfection in of our humanity then is understood as a profound dislocation and a Christian life then is a long process of healing. He found within the ethical basis of Pelagius uh, an impossible goal, an optimism about human nature of wrong theological anthropology, if you will, that created an untenable situation for his things. You have to understand, as a, why, when I said the most important image of Augustine was Augustine the preacher, this is Augustine the preacher reacting to a set of ideas that he found impossible for his community. And so his understanding then is that uh, of the centrality of love and our ethics are defined by what we put our attention towards. Let me just jump to the end and uh, two sets of images. Here's this quote from Robert Marcus that I think is helpful. That Augustine's view allowed him to give space to areas of subtler shades. Augustine located the secular in the saculum. Saculum is the Latin word that would be a near not an absolute, but a very near equivalent to the Greek word cosmos. We've used it. We, out of this, we get our adjectival form secular, and many of in our church societies, you, the word secular is a bad word. It wasn't for Augustine. It wasn't for the founding fathers. Remember the phrase of the founding fathers that's on the back of the dollar bill? Novus ordo secularum, the new order of the ages. That it's the space and time, it's the place where creation exists and where God's work happens. So he located the secular in the sacrum, in that intermediate and temporary realm in which human affairs unfold. Sacred and profane as absolute terms are just too stark, too strong, too absolute, too es eschatologically driven to reflect the world in which we live now, describe our temporal affairs. So let me give you an image to think about that I think is helpful. Um, or set of images and thinking about that I think captures this. Has anyone been to the v Vatican Museum and seen the Raphael rooms? A few of you have. Spectacular, amazing paintings. But all the better, almost every single one of our colleges at one time or another have used this in their advertising, right? <laughs> that, that's the School of Athens. How many of you know this painting, the School of Athens? 
Sometimes more, I would have thought more. Um, at one time, I think, I'm sure every one of the Christian colleges and public universities have used that image in one form or another. But what's interesting, sorry, I pointed the wrong one, down here, School of Athens. So you've got Plato and, and Aristotle and Socrates in the Stoa philosophizing. In the same room, equal painting is the other one, the disputation on the sacrament, the disputa. And it's an amazing room, so those of you who've been there know this. You walk in and it's two, it's a lo two long walls. These are massive paintings they, that take up the upper registers and, uh, and they're two sides of the same room. So um, on one side, so if you go in and step in the middle, on one side in the upper register and it's one and a half times as long as this room maybe, twice as long as this room, one upper register is the, uh, is the School of Athens, and you have to turn your back, turn around, put your back to it, and on the other side, equally big, is the disputation on a sacrament. So here you have one, if you will, secular image, of a, image of a secular event, and then on the other you have a theological, a church event, a sac quote, unquote, sacred event. And that's really interesting, and, and what I think is really important to understand within, and why I think it's actually a great representation of Augustinian theology, is when you go in, and, and there are two other images on the, uh, on the obverse and reverse, on the opposite, uh, on the end walls, but they're not as important to this understanding, this interpretation. I, at least I think, maybe I missed something. It's possible I didn't get what Raphael was doing. That's very possible. Um, what's interesting about this is you can go in and you could look at the School of Athens, I can't remember which I said was a disciple, let's say the School of Athens is this side, and you can look at it and really behold it, take it in, and analyze it, study it. Then you can spin around, and do the same with the disputa, the disputation on the sacrament. So you can look at the theology and take it all in. So there's a little bit of a sense in you, the person, the same person, is having to work to take them all in. And they aren't, they aren't exactly the same, but there is a point in which you can back up at the wall and you can see both with a bit of a distorted perspective, but you can look down of a long room and see both at the same time, but a little bit of distortion involved. Um, the perspective changes it. What's interesting is what Raphael does is he makes the person the integrative object. He makes the viewer, looking at the paintings, the person who has to figure out and work to integrate both of these ideas, these concepts, these visions. It's the same person. So it's not Dr. Porter and me standing back to back and he gets the privilege of looking at the School of Athens and I get the privilege of looking at the Disputa and it's only one of us. It's both of us moving back and forth and around it and making sense of it. And I think that's very much Augustine's thought about how we have to manage life in this world, that he sees us as this point of integration trying to make sense of these things. And so as we understand the point of what he understands to be the spiritual life, let me bring it to a close with this and go back to the earlier point on theosis or deification. He understands that God comes in and remakes us, re is remaking our soul. It is a process. He does hold a, can it, it's not wrong to say that he held a ransom theory, um, but that was just the particular mechanism God used as a part of, the, of this process of remaking. It wasn't the point of it, it was a part of it. And so the mistake are those who take a look at ransom theory and, make, and think that's the whole of his doctrine of atonement. It's only one, it's a mechanism as one piece. And I think for Augustine, it's the least interesting mechanism because it doesn't really show up much in his sermons. It really shows up in his debates with Pelagius because it fits the, that apologetic purpose. But those were very limited, focused works. They don't represent the whole of his thought. And so it's the preach theology one has to pay attention to with Augustine to make sense of it. Here's an just a little bit of it. One interesting bit on this. So I work a lot on the sermons as well and the nature of oral communication, oral, oral society, and the nature of the development of doctrine in that period. A reasonable assumption to make is if somebody's interested in something and thinks it's important for their community, it would get repeated regularly. Out of the 950 sermons, how many times do you think Pelagius' name gets, now he's got 13 books on Pelagius and it takes up about 17 years of his life. Out of his 950 sermons, any guesses how many times Pelagius is named in his sermons? No, more than that, but not much. Three times out of 950. 
Now we know that someone can deal with an idea without naming them, so it's not just enough to say is the name there or not. So when you look at and identify what are some identifiably anti-Pelagian themes, maybe another 20 sermons come up. That's about two or three percent of his sermons. Now I'm not saying it was an unimportant idea for Augustine, but he didn't think it was a central idea for the discussion amongst the laity, amongst the community. It's not something he preached on. So predestination is something he thought about, and he thought it was an important debate for some particular purposes, theological purposes, but it didn't, he, it didn't amount to something that was a substantial part of his pastoral work. And that's an important thing to bear in mind. Now one might want to say Augustine was wrong and it should be a part of his pastoral work, but one can't say it's central to pastoral work and use Augustine as a justification for it, as some have. So it changes the way we interpret him. So let me uh, leave that there and take some questions. Let's thank Stan. And we do have some time uh, for some questions. And um, I'm wondering if there might be a student that would uh, have a question that, that we could start with. I know we have a group of psychologists here. I didn't speak into that so much, but perhaps you saw the ways it applies to issues in psychology. I'd be glad to attempt a response on that. Hmm. Or on anything. Yeah, yeah. You okay. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed how you drew themes of Augustine that really do resonate with the development of psychology. Um, alienation is a mm. theme that we see beginning with Kierkegaard. Mm. Yeah. Um, even the nature of self, you know, psychology of the late 19th to early 20th century becomes obsessed with defining the nature of the self and all. Um, so I just, I, I, you know, I, it, it's great. I, I appreciate your kind of nailing a bunch of things that really resonate with, with kind of a, a much more modern sensibility of a lot of these themes. Uh, my question is, maybe getting back to your, your kind of conclusion about what Augustine said in his sermons versus what he said to others. And this is maybe not necessarily psychology, but what would you say if Augustine came back to 2024 North America? What sermon would he preach to American Christians? Oh. Evangelical Christians in a time of crisis that we face right now. Want to get run out of here on a rail? <laughs> <laughs> what, what thematically do you think he would really hone in on? Um, Boy, there are many of them. Boy, I think one is to remember for the Christian tradition. And Augustine would have thought this, um, I think, profoundly. Patriotism is a false friend in the Christian tradition. And um, it's, it's a kind of idolatry. It, it, it puts the wrong sense of community forward, of identifying with the community. So I think he would challenge the language of nationalism that is shapes. And the idea of American exceptionalism. Look at how much the church in America has bought into a notion of American exceptionalism. I think he would reject that as roundly as he rejected Roman exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the parallels are amazing. Right? Yeah. Time and place. Yeah. yeah. The, um, I think he would, uh, well, there's so many points of challenge, so many, uh, he wouldn't recognize the church. Doesn't mean he's right and we're wrong. The C.S. Lewis has a great essay on this. It was the preface to uh, a translation of Athanasius's work on on the incarnation, it's called uh, Why Read the Old Books. And he says, um, why should we read the old books? It's not because they're right and we're wrong. I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing here, not quoting. Um, but because they're different. And he says, like, when we, when we, when we read the, uh, the public speeches of uh, Hitler and Roosevelt and Churchill, people who couldn't disagree more with each other, at least two of them couldn't disagree more with the other. You think of them as being polar opposites. Secretly they're aligned because they have the same sort of expectations, the same sort of affirmations. We call that worldview or assumptions. And so why read the old books? Because their assumptions are different than ours. And it's not that ours are necessarily wrong or theirs are necessarily wrong. It's that they're different and it gives us a tool to critique our own. And if where we differ, we then have to step back and say, well, man, Augustine thinks differently. Why is that? Not is he right. That's a reasonable question to ask as well, by the way. 
But it's not simply, is he right, but why does he differ, and should I pay attention to that? And what, what can I learn from that difference? And I think there is hardly a bit of our understanding, of self-understanding as Christians in the 21st century, in the 21st, whatever we're in, uh, that he would find alien and different. I don't know, is that a helpful? Uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for that talk. So interesting and informative and uh, rich. And mm -hmm. draws together lots of things uh, that our Augustinian program will have been thinking about. Um, I'm, I'm very, I haven't contemplated in, uh, what you've been pointing to as his rejection of perfectionism, mm -hmm. and seeing this operating Salvific perfectionism, mm. or what, what are they called? Um, his, um, I was talking to some students today about his rejection of political perfectionism. Mm. And so, and this enables him to justify, indeed require, that Christians be involved in the messy world of, of civic life right. uh, and not be separatists. I don't think he would require us to be but he gives us permission and freedom. And in fact, he, he, it, there's a kind of instrumental value. So in book 17, sorry, book 19, chapter 17 of the City of God, he says, our, the peace of, uh, that God gives us is not like the peace of this world. And he sees the peace here as being a privated derivative form. But he says, to the extent that that peace can serve us in pursuing the peace of God, we ought to engage with it, participate, and encourage it. He says the same thing about justice. People miss that he does, he actually implies the same thing on justice. He says, we don't, we don't have vera justitia, that is, we don't have true justice, but there is a derivative kind of justice. I was thinking it was required just because he also, in very other passage, says, um, God gives us two commands, you know, uh, to love neighbor as self, and so you've got to get in there and help, be ready to help. Yeah, I think there's a sense of getting ready to help, but you know, he didn't he didn't know democracy, and no. you know, they, they live in a world of. He, what's really interesting, I read his letters to Marcellinus and Lucian, who were the magistrates of his of uh, Numidia and Proconsular Africa, one a Christian, one a pagan, writing him back and forth, and that helps lead to the writing of the City of God. Those are letters one thirty six to one thirty nine, one thirty three to one thirty nine, roughly. The point I wanted to write is it almost seemed to me as if in some places uh, when you say, yeah, he argues this, but he doesn't, it's not a center point for him and he doesn't really need that. It's kind of figure of speech and he uses it. For people. It's almost as if um, he is also rejecting in philosophical methodology, the methodology of perfectionism. And so, you know, if you're in a limited dialectical context, you're arguing against a heretic Metaphor or, or image and the, or limited idea that's yeah you know, truly useful to the point you get to use it you have to use it um, to make your dialectical point mm. um, is that the whole truth of the matter that's going to be the grand unifying vision of your theology no so also mm. you know rejects uh, perfectionism even in philosophical methodology mm. it's probably I haven't thought about it in that way I need to think about it further but I intuitively that sounds right to me. The, um, I mean, to be sure, he's not, he's not absolutely consistent in all that he does. So mm -hmm. <laughs> some of his handling of Pelagius is, uh, well, more, less of Pelagius than Julian of Aquanum, uh, the, the Pelagian who was really his intellectual equal in a way that Pelagius was not, um, and with whom he had the most bitter and tractable debates. Both of them pushed each other to the bitter ends of their positions. Mm -hmm. And you see them, I think, both making unfortunate comments and statements where they're, they're just, they've had it with each other and they're just at that point screaming at each other and it, it's, not a, it's not a model of virtuous dialogue, shall we say. <laughs> so he had his clay feet. <laughs> uh, Jeff? So picking up on this perfectionism uh, issue, and this is a speculative question that mm. may not be answerable, but. So some people criticize um, Wesleyan revivalism 
Hmm. Uh, especially the notion of entire sanctification, to which the answer was, well, no, because we're continuing to emphasis, emphasize the anguishing need for divine grace and, and transformation. What do you think um, Augustine would say to that? Where would he weigh in on that position? This has stumped the speaker day. Um, <laughs> Um, let me come out that obliquely. Um, the Reformed tradition reflecting on Augustine adapted, and in some places misadapted Augustine, <laughs> in thinking about the nature of its anthropology, and you know, like they would say, for example, that this you will hear those who say that predestination is all about the sovereignty of God. And you know, if you really think God is sovereign, then you would think predestination. It's not what Augustine thought because he came out from his anthropology. He got there from anthropology, not from sovereignty. So it was a bottom-up, if you will, analysis. Now, where am I going? To? It's because one of the terms that, that I think was used in the Reformation, Calvin and others, that was, well, I'm critical of other things, I think this was a helpful inference of an Augustinian position, which was total depravity, as long as one understands what Calvin meant by it. So total depravity, which is often you, described in a distorted way, does not mean somebody's absolutely evil. It means the whole part of them is afflicted. There's nothing that's not afflicted or tainted by the impact of the fall. That, I think, is a very Augustinian notion, so that, that it's all afflicted. So I said I was coming at this obliquely to try and answer it. I think for an Augustinian position would be everything is affected and we can't know the full levels of the impact on my spirit. And it affects me in ways that I can't even fully understand and might not in my life understand. Mm -hmm. And the grace of God is not above redeeming me through that, but um, that affliction, I think, is so diffused throughout the person that I think he would be um, dubious maybe the word I want to use, for um, that, uh, that, no that Wesleyan notion. Is that helpful? Does that make sense? Yeah.